Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions you may have during the presentation. If you are unable to get to them, we will answer them at the end. My name is Braden Knudsen. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner who will be giving an update on Ancestry.com. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 30, 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Howdy, how are you all out there today? Um, we're going to talk about Ancestry.com. Uh, some of you may be aware, and probably anyone who has worked with the program is aware, that they have uh, made substantial uh, changes to their website. Uh, these are often called updates, but uh, sometimes the users to the programs are not as happy that thinking it's an update as this has just changed. But uh, I think you'll find that uh, the uh, changes in most cases, uh, except for a few things that are still uh, being tuned up by Ancestry, are probably uh, beneficial to everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to note that Ancestry.com is one of the FamilySearch.org uh, partner programs and those who belong uh, to the LDS Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have free access to this program. The first thing that you should do uh, when you obtain an Ancestry subscription is to start by entering your family tree. There's a very good reason for this. First of all, you should also enter at least your first three or four generations. And you should, uh, it's not advisable to, op to upload a GEDCOM file. Now, this seems to be contradictory. If you're starting your family tree and you've been working on your genealogy for some considerable period of time, you probably have a fairly large file and feel like it's a good idea just to upload the whole file into the program. Uh, Basically, the idea here is that uh, uh, Ancestry and the other uh, large online database po programs are providing research hints or record hints. And these uh, record hints that they provide in the form of the shaky green leaves uh, are very, very useful in building a family tree. So uh, to kind of mine the information that's in Ancestry, you can uh, put in your first four generations and then using the uh, hints, the record hints in the form of green shaky leaves or green leaves, then you can uh, build a tree that will be um, based on sources. Uh, the danger, I think, of, of putting in a GEDCOM file stems from the fact that you may or may not have everything in your tree uh, sourced uh, based on some uh, valid source or um, supported by adequate research. Um, if you are able to separate out that type of information and only upload a, ver a verified tree, it would, be, it would be most advisable. But uh, I think that's really the case that I've seen in, with most of the family trees that are out there. Um, in other words, what we're trying to do here is let Ancestry find your ancestors rather than you spending the time and effort uh, to do that. Uh, you may find that uh, as uh, the resources are added to your family tree, that some of the information or even uh, a lot of the information that you already have may be, uh, end up being corrected by the sources that are found by Ancestry. They actually do this in a very efficient manner. So I would, I would suggest that you consider uh, letting them build your letting Ancestry uh, build your family tree on its program. Um, 
But if you uh, feel it is necessary to upload your entire file, file or JEDCOM, I, just, I think you'll get the same uh, um, benefit, but you'll just have a lot more work. Uh, you'll have a lot more um, green leaves to, uh, to process. And also, as you do this, be sure you watch for those green leaf hints. Don't ignore them. Um, I think historically, if we go back a few years, if you're one of these people that have been on Ancestry for, uh, in a, say, more than four or five years, six years back, even more than that, uh, you may remember when the green leaf hints were, um, were first introduced. Uh, they were essentially at the time they were just automatic lookups. In other words, they took the information that was in the tree and uh, tried to match it the same uh, way you would with uh, search through a, uh, the search fields with information that was in the in the program. Uh, the results from the the green leaf hints were were not uh, you know, very accurate in the sense that they uh, may or may not correspond to your person. So uh, after, but there have been some substantial changes in the last uh, couple of years, particularly in the last year or so, and the green leaf hints now are very accurate, uh, very pertinent to the individuals, and uh, only begin to become uh, been begin to be a little bit less reliable as you go back in time. Um, it's my experience that most of the of the record hints and suggestions that come in, are coming from uh, the programs out there uh, begin to be a little bit flaky after about 200 years in the past, 200, 250 years. It's really easy to see why that's the case. One is because there are fewer records back at that time point, and in many cases there are a lot of similar names, and it makes it very difficult to tell uh, one William Smith in England from another William Smith in England. So um, that that's where the uh, where Having some genealogical expertise uh, is a great assistance, even if you are um, working for um, working with a program that gives you a lot of record hints. Okay, well, this is uh, if you're loading in your tree, and this is what your family tree would, might look like on uh, on Ancestry. Uh, then you can click on the green leaf hints. Uh, in this case, I have three hints. Uh, I would normally have more, but I, I tend to process them uh, pretty regularly, and so I have uh, a lot of sources that have been added to, my, uh, to the people in my family tree. And uh, these, if the, you click on one of these green hints, then you'll, it provides you with uh, a suggested record, and you have the option of choosing um, whether or not you want to add that to your family tree or not. Uh, just a comment on other member family trees. Uh, you need to look at these. Uh, these will come in as, as hints, uh, record hints from Ancestry, saying you have so many people who, uh, who share that person with you, uh, and uh, they're adding, being added, or you have the option of adding them as a source. To your, uh, to your family tree, showing a link there. Um, the, uh, the, the crucial thing here is to examine each of these suggested family tree connections for any sources. Um, I think you'll find that the majority of them have very few, if any, sources added. It's not unusual to see uh, one or two with a few sources added, but uh, generally, through the list of all those family trees that may come up as suggestions, there there's not many sources. This, of course, creates a very interesting um, question about uh, the use of the of family of ancestry uh, because they're providing so many record hints, and because those record hints are are easily attached to individuals to show. Uh, and support the information and correct the information in the family tree, it is really surprising that uh, more of the people who have their family trees on Ancestry do not uh, take advantage of this, uh, of the opportunity to substantiate the information that they have. Um, in addition to that, uh, generally uh, in the genealogical community, uh, information obtained from another family tree is considered to be user submitted information. In other words, it's it's something that somebody copied from someplace else 
and uh, not considered strictly not considered a record source. Um, if you add a, a, a connection to the tree, my my practice here is uh, if I add a connection to a family tree, it's because the person who is maintaining that tree is someone that I know and uh, uh, someone who is being very careful and adding a lot of sources to their family tree. And this is really the summary of that is attach only family trees you know are reliable because you have an experience with or, or understand who the person is that's making the tree or has uh, supplied enough sources that you're, you have a confidence level that the information is correct. However, this is just sort of a, a, an exception to the rule. There's always seems to be an exception to every rule, but this one is that uh, looking at these member family trees that are suggested may help you find additional sources. That isn't always the case, but it's, it's possible that when uh, you look at your individual and you see that your person has one source, you look at a suggested family's uh, a tree on the, uh, from, an, from a uh, record hint, and uh, they have eight or nine sources, you just might want to check out and see what, <laughs> what they have that you don't have. And you might want to go ahead and add those sources to your own family tree. Um, once you uh, approve a, a source uh, and it is added to your family tree, in this case, uh, this individual, one of my great, great grandmothers, uh, her, we've, I've added uh, quite a number of sources and they appear on this uh, detail page uh, for her, uh, it's called the uh, facts page from Ancestry where they have the information concerning her, uh, her the uh, family and also concerning her individual records. Um, in, it, in looking a little closer at this the page, it's called the facts page, you'll see there's a, a, a set of four tabs across the, the middle of the screen here. It's at the upper portion of that. And uh, their life story, the facts, the gallery, and the hints. It shows here that there's one green uh, hint out there, one green leaf hint. And uh, we could look at that if, we, if, if I wanted to do that. So first of all, we're going to kind of go through these um, uh, tabs to see what, uh, how they're made up. The first one is the life story. And that consists of a, um, a map and uh, information, uh, background information that uh, is in the nature of a timeline uh, about this individual. So if you, uh, the, the main value of having this is uh, it puts the information, for some people uh, can understand the information more readily if it's in a narrative form. In addition, this uh, particular type of view is a way of suggesting additional records and sources and places which you may want to look in order to um, uh, further support and extend your family tree. The second uh, page out here is called the facts page, and that's the page where I showed you in a small view, view previously. Uh, it consists of a timeline. Uh, now, this is different than the, the narrative timeline. This is strictly a, uh, an event timeline showing uh, the sequence of the events in the life of this person. Um, the, the advantage of having this kind of a timeline is that um, any of the events are the events are put in a chronological order, and you can review them to see if they make any sense. Um, if you have something like uh, uh, ten school uh, graduates from high school, and then it says uh, burial, and then it says uh, death record, and then it says uh, gets married, uh, you can start to immediately kind of suspect that uh, you may have some dates that that don't fit and are out of line here. Um, timelines, uh, that's kind of an extreme uh, example, but timelines uh, do give you an overall view of, of the person's, uh, of the records that you've accumulated about a person and the events uh, in, the, in their life 
uh, that are substantiated by various records, uh, including the uh, birth of children and things like that. Um, just a, a, another way of visualizing uh, the, the information that may be helpful. Okay, the next uh, set is the sources. Uh, if you have sources and have added those sources to the person, um, they will appear in a list here. By clicking on any one of the sources, you can view the original uh, from the record with, uh, and if they are, uh, have uh, a, uh, if they're a digital file or if they have a, a, a picture involved with it or some other item, then those will show up uh, here where you can click on them and view them. Now, sources, we need to talk about that for just a minute as far as, as what we're adding here. Um, a record becomes a source when a person, when a, the researcher, looks at the record, evaluates it, and determines that the information that's contained in the record uh, is pertinent to or adds information to uh, someone in their family tree. So the criteria here for incorporating a source is that the source be um, that add, add information that it adds information to a person's uh, life history, life story. Um, the question, of course, is what is or what is not a source. Uh, we get into all sorts of, of schemes out there for ranking sources according to their reliability, or uh, we have what are called primary sources, secondary sources. Um, generally speaking, those uh, there is a use of the word source to that overlaps uh, the use of a word document or record. Uh, a document or record, by an, in and of itself. Uh, is not a source, but uh, it's very frequently that people refer to them as sources simply because that's uh, the term is expanded to include the generic idea of a, of a document. And like I said, uh, the document only becomes a source when it when it has information that about your ancestor. Now, the information in the source may not be exactly the same as the information you already have in your family tree. You have to evaluate the information to see whether it is more reliable than the information you already have. Uh, for example, uh, you may have a census record. And the census record may spell your uh, ancestor's name in a way differently than you uh, uh, are accustomed to seeing the name spelled. The question there is, did the person who took the, uh, uh, the census record, the enumerator from the US Census Department, for example, or wherever the census record was created in whatever country, whether that person actually ascertained a spelling or they just wrote down what they heard? Uh, most of what we hear from the US Census, would see in the US Census records, the census uh, takers uh, in the past were listening and writing down what the people told them rather than uh, soliciting any kind of consistent spelling. Additionally, as you go back in time, um, it's very apparent that, for example, in using continuing the example of a name, that uh, names did not coalesce into a, a more consistent structure until around the 1850s. So any, any name before 1850 may or may not uh, have variations in the way it's spelled. It's not unusual to go back in records and find out that your ancestor spelled his or her own name in various ways uh, over time. Uh, so it's just, uh, you know, that's one of the areas that you need to, to learn to evaluate. Uh, generally speaking, for as kind of a general rule on that, uh, what we would consider, what I would consider to be the important, um, the most reliable name would be the the earliest one recorded for the person. If there's a birth record, it would be the name on the birth record. If it's uh, something later, then it's uh, the earliest record in their life. Uh, names have a tendency to drift over time. Um, and so it's possible that uh, a, a name later in life uh, may have been uh, adapted to the person's uh, uh, preference rather than what was given to him on or her when they were when he was born or she was born. 
Okay. Um, next we have a family. Um, this obviously is a, a modified view of a pedigree. The first two uh, individuals shown are the parents of the primary person and then the spouse and children. Um, one of the quickest ways to determine whether information in a family tree is correct is to look at the, the uh, dates and uh, do what's called do the math. That is, find out how old the mother was at the, the uh, supposed birth of any one of the children. Uh, just uh, yesterday, I was involved with uh, looking at a family tree with, with uh, someone and, and talking about the accuracy when we found that the mother uh, would have been 75 years old at the time of the birth of the last child, which uh, probably didn't work. Um, there's all sorts of things like that, but that, that's the kind of, of mistake that can sort of creep in. Additionally, uh, the dates could have been reversed. Um, you know, 1916 can become 1961, fairly easy, and the other way around. And so uh, sometimes you need, to, uh, uh, you need to look through those lists to make sure that the, uh, that the children are accurately represented in the time frames. Uh, the advantage, of course, of having a, a family tree in a program like Ancestry is that uh, if you want to do some research on any individual in that family, any of the children, you simply have to click on their entry and uh, uh, go up to the uh, uh, tools up there, which give you the end the search, where it says search tools and an edit at the top of the page and do a search for that person and they will search the records for uh, records about that particular person using the information that's in the family tree, which is extremely helpful. Okay, so there are tabs for each person in your tree. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the next one over, which is gallery, the gallery. Um, Actually, I like this particular feature much better than the, the previous way they had of showing uh, the media items. Uh, this gives you a, a one page. Uh, if it's, I guess, if you had a lot of media items, it'd go over to another page. But in this case, all of the the media items that are attached here, including the documents that are found uh, from sources. Uh, and added as sources to uh, to your individual are uh, accumulated in one place where you can look at each of those at a time. And I, I think it's a pretty good layout and it's, kind of, it's helpful to uh, have them all shown here. If you need to go look at any of these sources, obviously you can just click on it and pulling it up at full uh, into full size and examine it. Um, a question that comes up uh, frequently is, uh, can I download any of these? And the answer is yes, uh, you can. There's uh, just by opening them up, there's usually a download to your computer provision that lets you download this to your computer if you wish to do so. The fourth one over here are the hints. Um, obviously, you can see these hints as leaves, uh, green leaves on the pedigree view. Of, the, of your family tree, but this one gives you a count of how many hints you have available for a specific person. Uh, I think it's sometimes more efficient to work with individuals rather than try to uh, work with a family tree. Um, it's nice to have a, a, a sort of graphic diagram of, of who you're related to in a pedigree chart type format. Uh, helps people to uh, to recognize the relationships. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I find it easier to focus in on the individuals that I'm interested in researching. And uh, this is helpful to have the hints right here. Uh, once I click on this, I get a, uh, a suggested hint. In this case, it's a Utah compiled census, uh, census substitute index, 1850 to 1890. Um, and it's for a person named Ellen McKechnie in Palmyra City, Utah County, Utah. Um, this is what's in the uh, report. Now, 
uh, Ellen Sutton. The question is, who is Ellen Sutton and who is Ellen McKechnie, and are they the same person? And um, a little bit of information, you, you really need to have a little bit of information about the people as you're doing research and use the research to help you understand who they were. In fact, uh, Ellen McKechnie uh, was uh, Ellen Sutton. Ellen McKechnie, uh, Ellen, uh, married uh, a McKechnie first and then married Sutton um, when she was, uh, and then she married uh, uh, Linton. So she was Ellen Linton, and before that she was Ellen McKechnie, and before that she was Ellen Sutton, which was her maiden name. So what happened here, as a matter of fact, when this came up, I, I examined my family list, and I, and I realized that her first child, Sarah, had been uh, born uh, McKechnie. Her father was uh, the McKechnie guy. And uh, so I had to kind of reshuffle things because I hadn't put it in correctly. And I don't know why I hadn't done that, but that's the way it came up. So I changed it around. Once the record comes up, you can review the record and decide whether or not it is your person, uh, whether it is not your person, or whether it could be uh, maybe <laughs> it's your person. Uh, the advantage of the maybe collection is that it preserves that that search you've already done, the record you've already done. It doesn't go away, uh, but it comes up as a you have so many maybes <laughs> list on your on your person. So. You can go back and look and see if you've decided whether or not this record is the right person or not. Now, the question here in, in making the selection of this record, uh, I spoke a moment ago about part of this, but to kind of expand on that issue. Um, when you say that, yes, this is the right person, you are not saying that all the information on that record is correct. This is not a, a value judgment on the correctness of the record. It is only a choice of whether or not this person is the same person in your family tree. Now, the source says whatever it says, and it may be it may be have the wrong birth date, it may have the wrong death date, it could have the wrong uh, complete name might be wrong. Uh, but when it comes right down to it, the question is: Is this your person or not? Okay, so now if, if uh, for example, you've now run out of, uh, of green arrows or, I mean, green um, leaves, or you're now uh, wanting to find out some more information about your, um, your family, then what, perhaps what we need to do is uh, talk something about the search strategies. How do you go into this program and search? Um, one of the things that I've always uh, uh, been aware of with Ancestry is that they had a, a very superior uh, search uh, capability for and very powerful search capability. Uh, there's really two completely separate functions here. Their ability to find records using their search, their internal search, uh, and what are called algorithms or the instructions to the search engine on how to find people in their, in their, in their collections is probably, uh, well, not probably, but is definitely better than your ability to make searches through their search, search fields uh, by filling in names and dates and things like that. Um, this is probably the case with all of the larger online databases. They do a better job of finding people than you do. But in the event that you don't have somebody in your family tree and you still want to do research for them, or in the further event that you're not satisfied that they have found all the records that may be uh, pertinent, then you may want to look uh, to go ahead and do searches on certain individuals. Um, as a matter of fact, I routinely do searches on everybody that I'm concerned about. Uh, I found that I can always seem to find more records than uh, than the search engines do than the search engines do on themselves on their own. 
now let me kind of mention this right off this is a startup screen for my uh, for um, my program my version of ancestry first of all there are two different versions of the program out there first the uh, there is a library version and there's also a personal version the library version is going to have fewer um, uh, items on the startup page than your own personal version if you subscribe to the program. In addition, you can uh, you can customize the way that your page, your startup page looks. You can move these different uh, fields around so that you show the things that you're interested in on the startup page. So uh, when you do look at a screen and it looks different than what you have, you have to say, oh, OK, that's fine. It's still all ancestry. Don't don't get it disturbed by the fact that it's not quite the same as the way it looks on your computer or whatever. Uh, down here in this central part is the search uh, are the search fields for uh, for the program. Now, when you're searching on this, you're searching all the records in the whole program, and uh, the returns are going to be uh, uh, measured in, in in a lot of cases. Sometimes they're zero, but in a lot of cases, their returns are in the thousands or even the millions of records. A reflection on the com how common the name is or how uh, uh, general the search terms, how general the terms are that you've included. So in this case, what, uh, what you do is focus on, um, on trying to uh, adjust those search terms to limit the number of possible um, results from a general search of all the records. So what do, we, what do you do uh, when you have all of these search options? You can add events. You can search uh, with fewer options or more options. You can match all the terms exactly. Uh, you can search on keywords, uh, put in gender, race, nationality. Uh, and uh, limit the collections and other things that I'll point out as we go along. So what do we do to search? Well, the first rule of searching on Ancestry and any kind of similar program like this is enter a minimum amount of information and then add one fact at a time. Uh, it's tempting because they have all these fields there to look at to go in and, fi and uh, fill in all the information that you know. My answer there is, if you know all that information, why are you searching for this person? But that's just reflection I have on the search idea here. But let's suppose that uh, you really do know a whole bunch of stuff about somebody, but you are looking for more information or more or, or additional ancestors or whatever. So the question then is, how much information? Do you start with a lot of information and then take out a field? Or do you start with a minimal amount and add a field at a time? Um, I have found over the years of searching on Ancestry and other programs that um, beginning with a minimum of information, at least three pieces of information, the name of the person, a place, and uh, a date, uh, and of course, whether they're male or female, that would be four, but uh, it's sort of a minimum amount. And once you have put in those inf that, that much information doing a search and then evaluating from there what you need to do. Here's, here's, the, here's the issues here. First of all, you may or may not have guessed the way that the records show that person's name. Uh, you may think uh, that you know how your name is spelled, which I hear all the time from people. Well, our family name is spelled with an S-E-N, and it's, this is an S-O-N, so that can't be our family. Well, the answer to those kinds of questions, are, we go back to what I said earlier about the variations in names. Um, any kind of information that you're putting in may, be, um, may not correspond to what is in records. So what you're trying to do here is guess, in a sense, and the guesses become more and more educated the more you do, uh, you do searching online. But you're guessing what it is that a record would have said about your, your person. 
and trying to match that information. To some extent, the computer uh, program involved in the searching here can make up for some limitations. They may give you variations in the name. For instance, if the name is Smith, it may be spelled S-M-I-T-H, or it may be spelled S-M-Y-T-H, or it may be S-M-Y-T-H-E, or S-M-I-T-H-E. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways there. And, and uh, you may pronounce your name Smythe, or you may pronounce it Smith, but uh, to the computer, uh, it's just a variation in the name. And the person who created the record may not have, have, have been aware of your, of the way that you distinct, uh, you think your name is distinctive. And so they, they spelled it the way they either were most familiar with or uh, the way they heard it. So don't be too caught up in the concept of what's correct and what's not correct. All we're doing is looking for records that may or may not have the information that you're, um, that you're looking for. So the next step is once you have started with minimal information and you start adding the facts and don't get any results, then vary the search terms. terms. Look at the family. Uh, here you have your family. The, the father's name's George Smith. The wife's name's Mary Smith. And the children's name are... Uh, Robert, George, John, and Aloysius. Well, the answer here is start with Aloysius Smith. Uh, there are probably far fewer Aloysius Smith entries in the world than there are John Smith entries. Uh, that's kind of an extreme example, but that's the way it works. You choose the name that's the most unusual to do your search. Um, in using uh, Ancestry, by the way, you can search on a, on a surname only or a first name only. So, for example, if I were to search for my uh, great-grandmother in um, Apache County or Navajo County, Arizona, because she lived in both, because that's when the, counties, the county boundary changed. But if I was looking for her in Navajo County, I could look for all the Elizas in Navajo County, Arizona, and give a date of around her, uh, say, any time she lived there in 1920, for example. So if I were looking for Eliza's in, in uh, Navajo County, Arizona in 1920, I put in that information in Ancestry. And not, with, not being too surprised, I will find my grandmother in the first few entries uh, because that uh, variations in those terms uh, can be are searched on their face. So you, you can you get all the first name people with the name Eliza in Arizona, and particularly the ones who lived in Eliza Eliza in Arizona in in Navajo County. Um, and that that's helpful if if for example your ancestor has a, a surname that uh, is uh, indecipherable. In other words, nobody knows how to spell it. And they, everybody spelled it wrong, um, like Kiowakowski or something like that, you know, something really uh, difficult to spell off the top of your head. Um, but uh, there's all sorts of ways and combinations. You can put in, for example, a husband named uh, John with a child named Philip and a wife named Melissa. And it will find... All of that, all, if there are, if there that combination exists, it will find that combination of people. This, this is uh, when you get used to this concept that you sort of can float around and put in different places. You could say, well, I want all the Johns who lived in in Apache County, Arizona, uh, in 1910, and they were married to people named um, Phyllis. And you know, you might just find out there's only one. <laughs> in that whole county that corresponds to that search. And you've ignored the whole surname issue altogether. So this is, uh, this is a very powerful way of, of searching for information. And Ancestry supports this uh, in a way that uh, there are a few other programs can really match their ability to come up with this kind of information. Um, basically, what we're doing here is we're looking for patterns. We're thinking in terms of a family, a group of people in a family, 
as, as creating a pattern of names. Uh, a father and mother with a name, uh, children with, a, with the names, and that pattern of names can be used to find that family even if we don't know uh, the surname or we don't know the, how the surname was spelled. In addition, if we add in a surname after we put in certain pattern, then we could differentiate our, our family from uh, many other families that might be, um, uh, might be, have the same surname in, this, in the uh, same area. So uh, if we had uh, uh, somebody uh, with a, a very common surname, like Roberts or Johnson or, or uh, Peterson or something, and so we do a search on that, just by putting in the names of the, of the uh, first names of the members of the family and adding more than one or two names in, like three or four different names, we may find a record that matches all of the names of that particular people in the family. So these are kind of uh, important um, uh, ways of, of looking at searching on, uh, on Ancestry. You can try this on some of the other programs. I think you'll find that, that you'll have uh, uh, some pretty good success with Ancestry and maybe not so much with some of the others. Um, one other thing that's important is to look in specific databases. Now they call them collections. Um, in, in most cases, I would avoid a general search, searching throughout the entire program. Now, if I have no idea where these people lived or what I'm just sort of looking for the first few times, I may have to do a general search just to see if there's any records that come up that will help me to get past my initial um, lack of knowledge about the family. But if I'm starting to look and focus in on this family, then I want to look at databases in and in specific, the information that I am looking for may be in a list of, you know, 5,000 results on page 600 of those results or something, who knows. But uh, if we look at a specific database, the chances of identifying the, fa the family increase dramatically. So here we're going to do is folk here what we're going to do is focus on uh, the collections and the, the um, uh, selection down at the bottom of the page. Uh, first of all, when you click on the All Collections link, you'll see the little downward arrow there. That little downward arrow gives you a pull-down menu. Uh, and you need to make sure that this is either set on All Collections or is set on the country or group of countries that you're looking for. Because you could be set on England for, or UK, for example, and be trying to find somebody in America and not having much success. So you have to kind of focus on what it says down there uh, as to which collections you're searching. Below that, you have some green check boxes that, uh, that let you choose uh, historical records, stories and publications, family trees and photos and maps. Now, if you're searching for somebody who is, turns out to be in hundreds of family trees and everybody's got them wrong, then you probably want to uncheck family trees as one of the options for, for your results. You don't want to have uh, a whole bunch of family trees show up. Uh, if you're not interested in photos and maps, you can uncheck that. Uh, probably the most common one would be to check historical records and sort of uh, look for the others at another time if you're looking for information about your family. So these are two two cautions in this search menu that you ought to make sure ought to make sure that you are correctly selecting. Now the next one is uh, an extension of searching a specific collection. This is the card catalog. If you go to the search menu up in the top of the screen up there, it says um, search and at the bottom of that search list you'll have a reference to the card catalog. The card catalog lists all of the sources, all the collections in, in groups uh, called collections, all the different records that they have in uh, Ancestry. And there are 32,512 collections as of the date that this um, presentation was put together. And that, of course, will change over time as they add additional records to the, 
to the uh, collections online. Uh, in this case, over on the left-hand side, you can filter by location, subject, or type of collection. So you can narrow down uh, the field of, of collections that you might want to be adding information to uh, by um, uh, clicking on the little filters over at the size and selecting the type of record that you're interested in searching. Uh, in, it, in each case, you can get down to the point where you search individual databases. Now, the advantage, once again, to reinforce that, what I said earlier, is that the, by searching an individual database, you're, you're limiting the, the vast number of, of possibilities that there might be out there. Uh, it may be much easier to find a person in a specific county record than it is to search them in a worldwide records. Uh, especially if you know the county. Now this presupposes that you have some information of uh, the types of records that you're interested in and the, um, uh, the geographic area or uh, time period involved. Uh, here's an example. Uh, there's a filter where you can click uh, for stories, memories, and histories. So you can just look at stories, memories, and histories. Then you can filter it further for oral histories and interviews. So if you're looking for an oral interview or a history of your ancestor. And in this case, one of the ones that comes up immediately is US interviews with former slaves, 1936 to 1938. Now this is a collection in ancestry uh, of oral interviews that were done under the um, a Works Progress Administration Writers Project, where they went in and, and, and located uh, slaves, individuals who had been slaves during, during the time before emancipation in the Civil War. Of course, most of these people were very, very old by the 1930s. And they, uh, they interviewed them. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, I think there's much more than 100 people in here, maybe a couple of hundred people. Now, Here's the, the immediate reaction. You say, well, none of my ancestors were slaves. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But uh, you may not even know whether you did, whether they were or weren't. But uh, even if you don't know that they were, uh, maybe your ancestors owned the slaves. Maybe this is the only record you have of who owned that slave and, and maybe ties you and makes you solve who your ancestor was. So uh, none of these records are general, uh, generally records are, um, are a lot more useful than, uh, than you would immediately think they were. Now, but the reason why I brought up this record is, is pretty simple. One use of ancestry in doing searches in ancestry and using the filters is to determine the types of records that you all, that you have. Now I'm going to take that, I'm going to go back here, I'm going to, take the title of this record, U.S. Interviews with Former Slaves, 1936-1938, and I'm going to do a Google search on that, the title. Now, why would I do that? Well, because Ancestry doesn't have all the records in the world, and neither does anyone else, and if I go out and search on Google, I may find additional records on that exact same subject that may be as useful or more useful than just the one that was on Ancestry. So now I'm using Ancestry as a, um, a search, making search suggestions for how I'm going to search further for more additional records outside of the program. Uh, in this case, if I do that search on the slave interviews, I find out something very interesting. These interviews are also completely reproduced in the Library of Congress, and they have the oral interviews online. You can listen to the slaves. They have their actual recordings. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, it's really helpful to go out there and start looking around for records uh, on the, uh, that you find on these large websites. So you're using Ancestry to find the types of records to search, not just individual records. So you're going to go out and search for more slave interviews, or you're going to search for slave records. Um, now, we're going to kind of just a quick review here to, to, uh, to end up here. 
the the different parts of ancestry and the different companies and and associations that they have ancestry is really a uh, a group of companies that are all uh, operate under the ancestry umbrella if you will um, the one that is probably the most uh, uh, prominent and that is uh, advancing the most rapidly is ancestry dna um, Ancestry DNA is, uh, pro has processed well over a million DNA files in the last year or so, and it is a, uh, one of the fastest growing areas of their company. Um, you can uh, uh, you know, pay them $99. They will then match your DNA uh, up to uh, their da huge database and uh, give you some idea where your ancestors came from and perhaps uh, if you wish to do that and you're in the DNA, uh, if you, if you uh, are cooked into the DNA family tree, they can actually show you uh, cousins who have also agreed to uh, publish their information publicly uh, who match your DNA. So they may come up with somebody who's a second cousin, third cousin, whatever, uh, to you and, and show you um, the possible relatives. Uh, I was talking to someone uh, yesterday, again, uh, another discussion that I was having, and uh, he was explaining to me how uh, his wife was uh, adopted. Uh, they had done uh, some extensive research uh, in the town where she was from and narrowed down a potential uh, mother uh, genetically, uh, excuse me, not genetically, but uh, the blood relative mother or birth mother to a, a certain small number of people. And, um, and though, and in, in the case that, in this particular case, they, they did a DNA test. And um, with the DNA test, they were able to show conclusively which of the people uh, was her birth mother, which she then contacted and now has a very pleasant relationship with her birth mother. So this uh, can be a very, very powerful tool. Uh, it's not a substitute for doing your own research, but it is certainly a, um, uh, an, an adjunct tool. Ancestry also has an app that runs on uh, iPhones, Androids, and Android devices and tablets, uh, iPhones, iPads, all of those stuff. And it's uh, very full featured. Uh, you can add sources, uh, do all sorts of things right there on your phone or your uh, iPad. Uh, Ancestry has a, uh, a, par a partner program called My Canvas. Uh, previously, Ancestry would, would, was involved directly in printing uh, display books with photographs and pedigrees and things. And now uh, they're doing posters and things through a, a second com uh, the partner company called My Canvas. Uh, they have a company called Pro Genealogists, which they purchased some years ago. This is a group of, um, of genealogical researchers, professionals who are uh, doing business in primarily in Salt Lake City, Utah, but they have uh, resources in many different areas of the world to do research. And you can hire an attorney. It's not an attorney. Uh, I get I can say attorney because that's the only thing I ever used to say about hiring any when I was working. But uh, you can hire a genealogist. Uh, the Ancestry Academy is uh, open to uh, people who are who have uh, subscriptions to the program, and they have some uh, a, a whole series of presentations, and uh, they will they keep adding in new ones every month and, and circulating the round and giving all of these uh, classes presentations on on genealogical subjects. Uh, they own a company called Fold3, or a, it used to be called footnote.com. Uh, many years ago, everybody's pretty, pretty much forgotten that. But Fold3 is primarily military records, uh, a lot of records from the National Archives. There are other records on Fold3. Um, it, it is a, a, a valuable resource uh, for finding ancestral military records, but also uh, other information. It is also a subscription website, and it is and subscription to Fold3 is not included in your Ancestry subscription. Um, 
This is also the case uh, previously, uh, Ancestry uh, purchased a company called Genline.com, which was a Swedish company with Swedish records. Uh, those records have now been all incorporated into Ancestry.com's world uh, collection and the uh, Swedish company Genline is no longer active online. Uh, I have another company called Archives.com. Um, this company was purchased a, a couple of years ago by Ancestry. Uh, is still operating as a, uh, different, as another subscription website. Um, really haven't seen much change in that particular site since it was purchased by Ancestry. Last, they, they purchased a, com a company called Find a Grave, which has over 140 million grave records. Uh, very valuable company, uh, still free, uh, and it is uh, growing uh, pretty regularly, it gets larger and larger. Uh, very good place to find uh, information about the graves and grave markers. Uh, it also adds a lot of biographical information, but you need to remember that most of the information on Find a Grave is user submitted, meaning uh, don't necessarily uh, have sources. So uh, you'd have to look at it a little bit cautiously. Uh, there are links to other graves uh, who may be, that may be related to your deceased ancestor. This can be a very valuable way to add additional people to your family tree. Well, that gets us to the end of our presentation today. And do we have any questions? Well, thanks for watching. Uh, remind you that this is a BYU Family History Library webinar and that we have uh, these webinars are being recorded and put up on the BYU Family History Library website. There's a link to the webinars and classes and uh, a further link to the um, recorded webinars. So if you will uh, go to BYU Family History Library, you can see all of the previous uh, webinars and those that will be coming in the future. Thank you for attending.